Hello and welcome everybody to this live AMA for uh, the Sustainable Sweet Script community. Uh, every month I host these. I should introduce myself first. My name is Eric. I run the Sustainable Sweet Script Slack community for NetSuite developers. And every month I open up Ask Me Anythings like this to the public. Uh, I actually run them every week for members of that Slack community. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of questions to get to today, uh, like we can see on the screen. If you are curious about or want to learn more about the Sustainable Sweet Script community, you can check out sustainablesweetscript.com. Uh, thank you, everybody who's joining me live. And I got a whole bunch of questions this week on both email and LinkedIn. So I will get into it. Uh, the first question is from Jing. Have you ever taken, uh, and this is a multi-part question, so I will take it in parts. Uh, have you ever taken NetSuite certification exams? Yes, I have. I was around in 2014, I think, when the certification process first arrived, uh, when it was created. And so I held the developer and administrator uh, certifications from 2014 until about 2020. Uh, and I have not renewed them since then. And I'll get into a little bit about why as I go through these parts. Uh, do you recommend taking the review class and getting the Sweet Script certificate to someone who has been mainly functional and wants to expand their skill sets into the technical domain? Um, yes and no. Um, I don't know, I'm not familiar with any review classes necessarily. I know NetSuite hosts workshops and they publish study guides and example tests and that sort of stuff. And if you've already decided you want to get certified, you should definitely check out those resources. Um, I don't recommend or view the certificates as any sort of indication of mastery of SweetScript. Um, they're not there to teach you SweetScript, um, and I don't think any test in, you know, no single exam in any field, in any base, demonstrates mastery of any concept. Uh, the, the proof is in the real work. Um, I do the time. So and if you are asking, should I take the, should I get certified to learn SweetScript? No, they're not there to teach you SweetScript. Um, that's the last, maybe the last step you should do. Should you get certified if you are looking for a SweetScript job? Yes, they look good on resumes. They show at least some baseline of understanding and um, effort. But for me, uh, personally, if I'm looking at resumes, or you're telling me about your sweet script experience, I don't, doesn't really matter. It doesn't really signify much to me that you are certified. And that's no shade on the certifications or the exams or the people who develop these, these tests or anything like that. Uh, I just would much rather see you write real code, solve real problems, than show me a piece of paper that says you uh, went through a study guide and, and passed a test. But like I said, you should take all of that with a grain of salt because the last time I went through the exams was 2020. So they have likely changed a lot since then. All right, thank you, Jing, for that question. Um, next, uh, this one also came in on email from Daz more technical kind of specific technical solution question is there any context in which you would use a sweetlet as a central reference point for other scripts user event scheduled script other sweetlet etc uh, that would call this central sweetlet and process a certain segment of the required logic uh, if so is there is there an example you could share of one that you might have done in the past i have never built uh, I shouldn't say that. So yes, there are contexts where specifically moving logic to uh, sort of chaining entry points makes sense. It most often makes sense 
in a user event, when you have, uh, when you're creating a series of records and you need one user event to chain another user event, you have to inject something in the middle because user events do not trigger each other. Uh, NetSuite does that intentionally to prevent, to prevent infinite loops uh, of user events. And so one user event cannot trigger any other user event, but that's a very common need. Um, and there are a couple ways around that. One way around that is to take the shared logic and extract it from the entry point scripts and put it into a custom module. And then in whatever entry point needs to call that logic, you import the module and, and call it from multiple entry points. That is the most common way I solve this problem. Uh, I do this anytime multiple entry points need to share the same logic. And even honestly, when they don't, I, I try to keep my entry points as as dumb as possible. Their job is not to make decisions, is not to execute business logic. Their only job, entry point scripts, only job is to coordinate and delegate to actual logic modules. So most often I am building out the real business logic in its own module or set of modules. And then the only job of the various entry points is to call different modules to delegate um, the very common software engineering pattern, the delegation model. So entry points delegate to custom modules. Um, hard to like, I don't have any diagrams, I don't have any code to share, so it's maybe a little hard to visualize, uh, but yeah. Uh, and in this specific question with a sweetlet, um, before we had custom modules, this was a very common pattern, especially when you needed user events to chain, you would introduce a sweetlet in the middle. So the first user event would, instead of um, say creating and saving a record, it would call a sweetlet to do that work for it. Uh, and then that would let subsequent user events trigger. I called those a jumplet. Um, I think I have a jumplet um, blog article out on stoic.software that you can probably find. Um, I love that name. That's not a name I came up with. I can't credit it off the top of my head, but um, yeah, you, you used to interject um, sweetlets in the middle of user events that you needed to chain. It's a very common pattern in 1.0. Once 2.0 came around and we got modules and could very easily import and, and segregate logic uh, that that the need for that pattern went away, uh, largely went away at least. So yes, I do this all the time where I separate business logic, but I don't separate it out into another entry point. I separate it out into its own module so that any entry point can, can call it and, and use it. A uh, very common design pattern I use in almost all my projects, regardless of the, the need for, say, chaining user events. All right, thank you, Daz. Hopefully that helps. This one is from Stefan, who's here on the call. Hi, Stefan. Uh, I'm curious about your opinion on the API secrets page that NetSuite offers. I've experienced frustrations utilizing secure strings when working with third-party APIs that only support basic authentication. What patterns do you deploy for this use case? Okay, uh, the secrets um, API especially uh, like the the actual API for working with secrets in NetSuite is not well documented. It's very confusing to work with NetSuite's secrets API. Um, I have used them. I do use the API secrets to store um, sensitive information. Um, but the the secure string API is very confusing, not well documented, in my opinion, and the examples are not robust enough for the use cases that they offer. So every time I try to go back to using the secret, the secure strings, it's hard. I have to re-educate myself every time, uh, and that's not what you want in an API. So 
but I do still do that. So I do use the secrets API and the secure strings. I just, every time I do it, I have to re-educate myself and I don't love that. Um, other patterns I follow in the case of say basic authentication or where um, API secrets aren't feasible for whatever reason, but I still need secure strings. A common pattern, most common pattern for this or most common um, place you need this is in integrations. Uh, regardless of authentication, very often whenever I build an integration, I build a custom record that is the configuration settings for that integration. And it might have, you know, a bunch of different custom fields on it. I make it a singleton. I've got an article and a video about my singleton pattern. Um, so I make this custom record, I make it a singleton, and it has various field settings on it that I might need uh, for that specific integration. And then if I need, say, to, to store tokens or something like that, I can make a field on that custom record. I can restrict access to that record, to that field, and I can make the token field a password field so that it's you know obscured, obfuscated in the UI. Um, and all of those help to, it's a very easy way to retrieve, a you know, very easy, consistent way to retrieve that information. And it's mostly secure, obscured uh, from anyone who shouldn't have access to it. Uh, and if it's a password field, you can't log it out. So even if some nefarious actor is uh, as ab able to write code in my account, uh, they can't log out. The, they still can't log out the token or password or whatever other sensitive information that you have. Right. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Stefan's in chat and has a follow up. And you are able to take that password field and securely use that value in an HTTPS call. I mean, once it goes out of NetSuite, I have no, I have no control of how secure it is, right? But yes, everything like on the Suite Script side, um, uh, I don't know what the HTTPS, you know, what the NetSuite module like uh, HTTPS .post, uh, would do with that. I don't know if it would be discoverable there if it's a password field. I'm not sure about that. Um, so that would be something worth testing for everyone involved. Um, but those are the patterns I use for, uh, I, I think uh, Stefan's still in chat. Oftentimes the password field is unable to be decrypted. I believe NetSuite has guidance in the help for how to decrypt, uh, you know, how to, encode and decode the secure hopefully that helps stefan i'll move whoops i'll move on here to uh gal's question from linkedin how do you utilize third-party libraries and security measures you take before incorporating one of your one in your suite scripts i use third parties a lot i don't use a lot of third parties but i frequently use a small set of third parties um, quick list, uh, Lodash for sort of low level data manipulation utilities, uh, moment for anything date or time related. Um, uh, let's see, XML to JSON, I think the number two, I think it's XML to JSON. Um, or no, uh, Papa Parse. I use Papa Parse for like working with CSV files. Uh, and then yeah, XML to JSON for working with XML files and, and translating them to and from JavaScript objects. So those are four off the top of my head that I use. As far as how do I assess, um, I, if you look at any, you know, most of these are open source, all of these are open source libraries hosted on GitHub uh, and NPM. And so I, I tend to extend a lot of trust to very large, popular, well-tested um, third parties. So I don't, I don't just go pull anything off of NPM, uh, you know, for the smallest of use cases, but, you know, these large, well-established third-party libraries 
I am not a security expert, I'm not a, a cryptography expert or anything like that, or, uh, you know, that's not my area of expertise. So I tend to extend a lot of trust to the, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of downloads and, and uses that these third parties get in all kinds of applications all across the JavaScript ecosystem. So I extend a lot of trust to, um, I guess the more popular, uh, libraries, which is, you know, not a guarantee of security. Uh, but I don't have a security team. I am not a security expert, so I can't spend all my time, uh, doing that investigation. So I have to rely on the community at large, uh, to do that. So I don't just pull in. Obviously, NetSuite has a bunch of sensitive data in it. I can't leak that either. So I'm not pulling in just any library from anywhere. But um, there are so many checks in place with open source software uh, hosted by these these third parties that do um, that do have tools in place to do those sorts of audits and assessments. Uh, so I tend to trust them because I don't know how to do those assessments myself. Did that help, Scal? I'll get caught up in chat here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, Nick Williams from LinkedIn, what's the most complex NetSuite project you worked on and what did you learn from doing it? Yeah, um, the most complex project I worked on was uh, in 2014. So I was two years into my NetSuite journey at this point i had just been promoted to a, a lead development position and we landed a very large client who i don't think exists anymore so i can i can say uh, uh think geek uh, was an e-commerce website for a bunch of nerdy stuff uh in the 2000s and uh through through the mid 20 tens i don't think they exist anymore um but uh yeah great client loved their product or their their service um and every week i was living in phoenix and every other week i was flying out to fairfax virginia to work on this project uh i'm telling you all the background because this adds to the complexity of the project i was flying literally across the united states every other week to work on this project in person. So we were implementing NetSuite for ThinkGeek and um, they had this homegrown e-commerce platform built on Perl, I think. A lot of Perl, if I remember right. Um, they had this, and then they had a third party WMS and then they had NetSuite. And we, my job was to design all of the uh, connections into NetSuite between all of those disparate systems. And it was one, just a big technical challenge. I think at the time, 2014, it was the largest volume integration that had been done on NetSuite. Um, all kinds of transactions, you know, massive volumes of transactions flying through into and out of NetSuite. Um, and that on its own was tough. The travel added to the toughness uh, but the most difficult part of that was they had tons of products, tons of different products that they sold on their website. And most of those products had matrix options, had variations, variants, and uh, the matrix sort of feature of NetSuite was very, at least on the Suite Script side, Suite Script side at the time was very immature. And so I had to build custom product configurator essentially um, so that we could display all of the various matrix options on their e-commerce front end. And it was a nightmare. It was incredibly difficult. I was flying halfway across the country, no, all the way across the country just to sit in my hotel room a lot and write code until all hours of the morning 
uh, the early, early morning, I mean, it was awful. It was hard. It was definitely the toughest project. And it was very complicated just from the sheer number of products and variations uh, that we had to do. And then trying to display all of those, present those in a meaningful, understandable way in the user interface. Um, super challenging and not fun. Uh, what did I learn from doing it? I learned this is actually the project where I picked up uh, it, it totally shifted my my um, approach to writing code. Uh, I was I had come from a very class oriented, you know, like Java Enterprise Edition classes interfaces, um, heavy heavy rigorous object oriented programming, and this project, like I was stuck. I was completely stuck on this project. I was hammering out futile code at three in the morning in my hotel room for weeks, literally weeks. And I was stuck on how, like, how to dynamically, uh, generically map all of the different options to the different uh, products with different conditions for every single one. I was stuck. I did not have a technical solution for it. Uh, until I, I don't know what sparked this, but I thought I was sitting in my hotel room three in the morning and I remembered, uh, my data structures class from college. And I was like, I wonder if a tree would help me, uh, do this. And so if you think about like, you have this product that has all of these variations with different conditions, it looks, and if you sort of draw that out on a page, it can, you can make it look like a tree, the data structure, a, a tree. And so I found a library, third party library, interestingly enough, that added a tree data structure to JavaScript and everything just like fell into place uh, almost literally almost overnight. Um, and so I had spent all this time like trying to build these classes and interfaces and do this heavy object oriented design, trying to do all the right solid principle things. None of it worked. It was too complicated. It was too slow. None of it worked at all until I found the right data structure to model the problem. And then everything just flow fell into place from there, which I'm pretty sure from there, I found a quote from, I think Linus Torvalds, um, that is design your data structures first and the code will follow. And, uh, that project made me, <laughs> sold me on that quote. And ever since then I have shifted far away from classes, from interfaces, from that big, heavy object oriented, or I don't even call it object oriented class oriented programming. I've shifted away from that to a more uh, like functional core imperative shell uh, approach, which I think maps to NetSuite very, very well. I haven't written or shared extensively about this, but I should. Um, so this complicated project led me to this. I, I, so when I'm designing systems now, I think way more in terms of data structures and the flow between those data structures rather than like, what are the nouns and verbs in this systems? And how can I package them up into a class and make, and how do I interrelate those classes? Um, and that has, <clears throat> that has like completely changed how I wrote my sweet script for my whole career and, uh, for the better for sure. So that was a very long answer. So hopefully that helps. I learned a few other things. Uh, it's not fun, like, uh, one, it's not fun to fly across the country every other week. I don't envy anyone who has to do that. For anyone who's not American, that flight is 2,500 miles. Uh, so, uh, it's a long, long flight every, every other week, spending a whole week in a hotel room, then a whole week at home and just alternating for, for a year, for over a year, I think 18 months we were doing that. Um, what else did I learn? That's where I learned remote work is easier, <laughs> it's better. 
and I learned how to that you don't need to be in person to do to do good work to collaborate well. Um, let's see. That project almost made me quit my job and leave then leave NetSuite development. Uh, I was in a very dark place doing that project, uh, but it turned out great. Eventually, it just took a while to get there. Uh, Stefan asks, I uh, first comments. I'm a big fan of functional programming. Yes. I find it makes sense for most business use cases, especially within JavaScript. And I think specifically within NetSuite, uh, I think it maps really well to the types of problems we solve in NetSuite. They are very, it's, event, it's an event-driven model in the first place, right? All your entry points are events fired off by NetSuite, and you need to respond to that event in a very sort of temporal way. You know, event happens, do a few things, and, and we're done. There's not a lot of, there's not necessarily a lot of state or at least the state management that there is, we are not responsible. Write it to the database and that's where it kind of takes care of the rest. Uh, so I think functional programming flows really well. If you're not familiar with functional programming, I learned it by, on a wild hair, on a whim, I picked up Learn You a Haskell. Uh, Haskell is a functional programming language and there's a free book online called Learn You a Haskell. And I think it's just learnyouahaskell.org uh, or .com maybe. Um, anyway, if you, if you search for learning Haskell, I'm sure that book will come up. And that's where I picked it up. And, it, and once again, learning a, a totally different paradigm programming. I, I'm not a pure functional programmer. I don't think, I'm not a purist in any sort of sense. I think we should learn as many tools as we can. And then the sort of genius or expertise of a, of a software engineer is taking all those tools and knowing how to combine them to solve the problem at hand. So I use some functional programming concepts. I use some, you know, like solid object oriented concepts I use, but not classes, but, and I use, uh, and I combine them, I combine them into suite script solutions. I think functional programming flows very well into NetSuite development. Again, it's like you have an event that fires, you need to do several steps and then, and then you're done. And functional, describe, functional code describes that very well. Most people just, the unfortunate problem is that most people don't learn functional programming. Uh, I highly recommend doing that. Uh, learn functional programming, learn class oriented programming, learn imperative, learn, um, as many different paradigms as you can. And that will start to build this tool set that you have, and you'll start to see how they fit together. You'll start to get ideas based on your own context, your own background. You'll start to uniquely see how, how you can apply them to the problems, uh, at hand. Uh, Haskell. Do you think, uh, this is uh, again from Stefan, do you think that that project had an impact on how you decide to take contracts now? Yes. Lots of things have an impact on how I take contracts now. Uh, I don't take contracts now. Um, and there, there are lots of things that change the way I, I, did my, ran my contracting business when I was writing code for money. Uh, lots of things changed how I did that. And yes, I, that project made me get immediately. I wasn't working on my own. I was working for someone else at that point, but it taught me that I can, that's one of the things that taught me to be very specific or very very cognizant to, I'm going to restart. It taught me that I don't have to say yes to everyone. Uh, I don't have to say yes to every single project that comes my way. I think working in that environment at that time, the NetSuite, a NetSuite, small NetSuite consulting firm with no sort of specialization. It was just, we do everything NetSuite for everyone. Uh, it was great as a beginner. It was overwhelming, but it was great as a beginner to get that breadth of experience. But I knew right away when I moved on my own, I would not want to 
do that. I don't want to say yes to everyone. Uh, I want a very specific, narrow specialization so that one, I know who to talk to in my marketing, and two, I can develop uh, patterns so that I can get more efficient, more effective uh, at my job. Uh, if you're if you're if you're working with like manufacturing uh, one day and then e-commerce the next day and then sales order approval the next day, you can't. It's good to learn that stuff, but you can never get more efficient. And then, it's not never, but there's very little crossover in those those projects a lot of times. Or if you're, you know, in a bunch of different verticals, a bunch of different industries, again, that breadth is important, but it's not good. It's not um, conducive to a solo business to, uh, to, to market to everyone. You need to know exactly who you're marketing to, and then you can get more efficient in the execution of your projects. Um, and so that, that specialization, that niching down is really important for a solo business, especially because I don't have a sales team. I don't have a marketing team behind me. I don't, I don't have a team of developers. It's just me. I have to do all of those things. So I have to be very specific about what I do and who I do. Um, and then the other part is, this is not related to that project specifically, but I don't, I never build, I shouldn't say never, but once I got established, I stopped billing by the hour because there's no incentive when you're charging by the hour, there's no incentive for you to get better at your job. There's no incentive for you to get faster. There's no, all of the incentives, all of the business incentives are aligned against you getting better at your job, getting more efficient, getting more effective. All of those things actively hurt your business if you are billing by the hour. Uh, that's a whole different conversation of how I did bill my contracts. I all fixed prices paid up front agreed and paid up front. Uh, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> uh, I'm catching up on chat really quick. Yeah, okay. Uh, this question came in from Mel on LinkedIn, Mel Vargas. What are the most common mistakes you see NetSuite developers make? Um, there's a couple. I, I, I hesitate to call them mistakes, but um, I see a lot of new NetSuite developers who are not, uh, who are very quick to reach out for help. And that's great. Uh, if you, when you like say in the NetSuite professional Slack or something like that, they're very quick to reach out for help, but it's more like they get a problem. They don't immediately have an idea. So they, they reach out for help. They're not, they don't spend time getting, understanding the resources at their disposal, say how to read NetSuite help, for instance, like how to read the API documentation for SuiteScript. Um, and that's a really, really important skill, knowing how to read the API. I know that NetSuite's documentation is not like complete. It's not, doesn't have the best examples all the time, most of the time. Um, I don't envy them their task, the documentation team. That's a massive undertaking. Um, but uh, you need to be able to read a documentation. That's like a core skill of development. You have to be able to read API documentation. You can't just get like get to the first level of stuck. Like I don't immediately know how to write this code. So, you know, I'm going to throw up my hands and ask for help. There's so mistake uh, I'm, I'm putting in quotes. Number one is not getting good, not learning how to read the documentation that's at your disposal, knowing how to read the records browser, knowing how to read the NetSuite API documentation, knowing how to uh, read all of the documentation at hand, even if it's not the best documentation, should still give you a huge leg up uh, in being able to solve problems yourself. And then the second part of that, the other side of that coin is that a, another core skill of development, especially professional software development or professional anything really, is knowing when to stop spinning your wheels, knowing when to reach out for help. 
So there is a balance to strike. Don't spin your wheels forever, especially if you're billing your client by the hour. <laughs> um, because you're running the meter and they're not getting any value out of it. Um, but I got distracted. Uh, so reading uh, documentation and understanding when to reach out for help, building the network around you to know where to reach out for help. Uh, all of those things are, they're not mistakes, but they are beginning growing pains that you must overcome. Um, another one is, so, and, and I, it's very obvious when this happens, when you get a question, uh, I get questions a lot that are very evidently copied and pasted from say a JIRA issue or like an email from a boss or something like that. Um, Cause the, the, like, you know, there's a preamble of, hey, here's who I am, I need your help. I have this sweet script question. And then there's clearly like copied and pasted someone else's language. Uh, and then there's no explanation of, hey, I've tried this thing, I've tried that thing, I've tried this other thing and none of it's working. Here's like, there's just, here's a question with no context, help me. Um, so learning how to troubleshoot, learning how to read documentation, learning how to, how to ask for help. Those are all core skills of NetSuite development that a lot of new developers don't demonstrate. So those are three sort of core things. If you are a beginner, those are three very core skills that you want to start working on. And I have a lot of empathy for those new developers because a lot of times in NetSuite specifically, people get thrown into the development side. They're not developers by training. They're admins, they're functional consultants, and they either like have this curiosity that they want to get into it, or they get thrown into it by their boss or a client or whatever. So I have a lot of empathy for those people, uh, but mm -hmm. empathy doesn't like get you any, like doesn't get them any further, doesn't help solve their problems, right? They need to be able to, if they're going to continue down this NetSuite development path, they have to learn those like basic fundamental skills of software engineering. Um, so learn how to read documentation, learn how to troubleshoot, learn how to ask for help. Um, and there are lots of resources from the software engineering space of learning how to do those things, how to read documentation, how to troubleshoot, especially. Uh, you have lots of tools at your disposal, browser, console, debugger environment, testing, uh, like unit testing, that sort of thing, uh, logging, all kinds of debugging and troubleshooting tools at your hands, but you have to learn how to use them, just like the other tools I mentioned earlier, class-oriented programming, functional programming, whatever you might call it. Uh, more from LinkedIn, these two last two here from Rohan Pinto. Uh, at what point do you begin worrying about governance? Immediately, always, at the design stage. Um, I have lots of ways of assessing and designing with governance in mind. You, governance is a reality of being a good citizen of a shared platform like NetSuite is. Um, every system, every shared platform uh, has some sort of governance system. It doesn't manifest the same way, so, but Salesforce has one, NetSuite has one, any, you know, AWS has them in the form of, we charge you for how much you use. Um, any shared platform is going to have a governance system and respecting that system and working within it instead of trying to work around it is a huge factor of being a good tenant of that shared platform. I see lots of questions all the time about how do I work around governance? Like, how do I get around this limitation? And I don't answer those questions. You don't. I'm not going to help you be a terrible tenant. <laughs> uh, but you do need to worry about it. You need to respect it. You need to understand it. So the first thing you need to do is build an understanding of the governance of NetSuite's governance model, understanding what the limitations are, how they are calculated, uh, and then understanding how to design within those guidelines. So when do I start worrying about it? Immediately, right away. I 
document in every function. I, I even wrote a JS doc plugin to add a custom tag for governance to document the governance usage of a function. Uh, and I document the governance usage of every function I write. And uh, then I can sort of build up the governance usage of a script by following the chain of calls. I can document the formula. Uh, that's all a little bit after the fact, right? After the code is written, I can't do that stuff beforehand. So the biggest factor in governance is volume. How much, how much, um, you know, volume, how many records are you creating? How many HTTP requests are you sending? How many, so how many emails are you sending? That sort of thing. So understanding this sort of volume and the throughput, like the peak level, the, the big O limitation of your, the worst case, how, what's the worst case of how many, how many records you're going to save or whatever it might be. Understanding that helps you understand which entry points you need to leverage. If you know you need some process to create a thousand records, you immediately know you can't do that with a user event. You need some other entry point, something with larger uh, governance. You need a scheduled script, you need a MapReduce, you need uh, a bunch of restlets, uh, the case might be. But uh, governance, respecting governance is not something you bolt on at the end. It's something you design into your system or you design your system with the governance guidelines in mind right away. Uh, so in order to do that, you need to build your understanding of what functions use how much and how many times you're going to be calling those functions in the worst case scenario. Hopefully that helps Rohan. And another one from Rohan. When to use n slash search versus n slash query. Um, personal preference for the most part. They pretty much use the same governance we were just talking about. Um, I use both. I use both and I don't know that I have like a hard line. There's not really a hard rule of when to use one or the other. I see various claims that performance is better, including from NetSuite themselves, that queries perform better. In practice, I haven't actually seen that play out. In certain cases, it's true, but not. there's no universal. There are plenty of searches that perform better than their query counterparts. Um, so there's no universal like query is always better or search is always better. Sorry. <laughs> But these are just more tools in your tool belt that you need to understand. And you have to decide as the person in the hot seat with the context, uh, you need to decide uh, in for that specific system, which one is the best case. If you need users to be able to change things, search is better because queries, I see very few users using workbooks and certainly knowing how to write queries. Um, but they are making save searches all the time. So if users are involved, probably you're going to be working with searches. If they're not, maybe queries are better. If you don't know SQL, probably don't use queries. The query API is so much more verbose than the search API. And the search API is already incredibly verbose. <laughs> um, if you're not writing sweet QL. The, the add condition, add column, column, whatever it is. The, the query API, if you're not writing SweetQL, is wildly verbose, even more so than the search API. So it takes a lot of code to write a query if you're not writing SweetQL. If you need multi-level joins, search can't do that. So query is your, your only option. So understanding these tools and how they fit together and what their strengths and weaknesses are, that's maybe the core principle of your job as a NetSuite developer is understanding the pros and cons of all the tools in your tool belt and knowing when to apply them. 
I can't, I can't give you blanket patterns, you know, in every case where it's just always this way, because that's rarely the case. And even if you go from say one client or one account to a new one, and you have the same problem, the context is totally different, uh, which might change which tools you use. So sorry if that's not, I wish that was a shorter answer. I wish I could say n slash query all the time. Personally, I prefer writing sweet QL using n slash query, but I don't always do that. I assess the problem at hand and figure out the best tool for it. They're comparable. From my experience, the two modules are very comparable um, performance wise, governance usage wise. Uh, and so those are kind of moot at the moment. But so I can't give you a blanket answer. Um, they each have their own unique capabilities that they do offer or don't offer. And so you just have to learn, you have to understand those pros and cons um, for these and all the tools in your tool. Sorry that this job is hard. <laughs> There's a lot of nuance, a lot of context uh, that, and not a lot of crossover or reusability. It's very hard to make like fully reusable solutions in this space because the context is so very different from account to account. Okay. Let's see. It brings us to the end of our questions. I'm going to scroll through chat. Uh, let's see. Some comments from Stefan n slash n slash query does offer a query builder, but it's a pain in the butt. Yes, it is. Uh, Tim Dietrich has a great sweet QL tool that will help you like work out the syntax of a query writing sweet QL. I use that all the time. It's my homepage in NetSuite. So when I log in, I go straight to that page all the time. Um, the governance limitations per script type are well documented and the API documentations is how many units are consumed. Yeah, that's worth studying. Uh, that is all worth studying. Understanding the limits per script type, the usage per function, which functions do use, which functions don't use governance. Um, necessary, another mandatory knowledge set for NetSuite developers, all NetSuite developers. Um, right, I think it looks like, uh, so if you're here in chat, thank you for joining us. Uh, last chance to get any questions in. Uh, once again, this is the sort of free open monthly AMA that I do uh, every month, monthly. Uh, I do these every week for the Sustainable SuiteScript community. Uh, it's a Slack community that I run of NetSuite developers looking to accelerate their learning, um, build, share, share ideas, build community, build their network. Uh, so if you're interested in more of that, more learning more about that, you can check out sustainablesweetscript.com. Um, and uh, I think that brings us to a close. I don't see any more questions flying up in chat. Uh, thank you all for joining me here, and I hope this was helpful.